Before entering the courtroom, Donald Trump voiced his frustrations, claiming that the trial is hindering his campaign efforts. He described his experience of sitting in a very freezing cold courtroom for the last four weeks as very unfair. Trump asserted, they have no case and they have no crime, and proceeded to read aloud a series of quotes from legal experts who support his claims. According to Trump, the trial is nothing more than a witch hunt and an attempt at election interference amid his presidential campaign. The presumptive Republican presidential nominee also repeated accusations, without evidence, that Judge Juan Merchan is totally conflicted and that the Biden administration is orchestrating his legal troubles to undermine his political ambitions. Meanwhile, Michael Cohen, Trump's former fixer, is back on the stand for a fourth day. Under intense questioning by Trump's lawyer, Todd Blanche, Cohen admitted to speaking with reporters after Thursday's court session, but denied discussing the case. He also acknowledged meeting with Rep. Dan Goldman in 2019 to prepare for prior congressional testimony and admitted to lying during that testimony. Blanche pressed Cohen about the $20,000 he paid to the owner of Redfinch, a tech company that had done work for Trump. Cohen explained that he withdrew the cash over several days from TD Bank, stating, I just didn't want to take out $20,000. When asked if he had a duffel bag of cash, Cohen clarified it was a brown paper bag. He recounted, he came to the office and I gave him the cash. And so, as Cohen takes the stand once more, the courtroom is a battleground of conflicting narratives and high stakes. As the trial continues, Trump's lawyer Todd Blanche zeroes in on the financial discrepancies surrounding the payments to Redfinch. The courtroom holds its breath as Blanche presents detailed financial records, questioning Michael Cohen about the apparent shortfall in the funds. Blanche, with a steely gaze, states, You gave Redfinch $20,000, yet you took $30,000. You stole from the Trump Organization, right? Cohen, his voice steady but resigned, responds, Yes, sir. He admits that he never repaid the amount owed and acknowledges discussing this with both federal and state prosecutors. This admission adds another layer of complexity to the trial. Blanche presses further, aiming to bolster the defense's narrative. He points out that despite changes in Trump's role, Cohen's responsibilities remained unchanged. Blanche argues that Cohen functioned as Trump's personal lawyer and was compensated accordingly, even though no formal retainer agreement existed, an arrangement that had historical precedence. This moment is pivotal for the defense, as it seeks to undermine Cohen's credibility and portray him as someone who benefited from his relationship with Trump. The courtroom is charged with tension, each revelation adding to the intricate web of legal and personal conflicts. As the scene concludes, the focus shifts back to the impending cross-examination, setting the stage for the next intense exchange in this high-stakes trial. As the trial progresses, Todd Blanche shifts focus to a series of consulting contracts that Michael Cohen signed in 2017, including a notable one with telecom giant AT&T. Blanche's strategy becomes clear to dismantle Cohen's credibility by highlighting inconsistencies in his financial dealings and communications. Blanche, with a penetrating gaze, questions Cohen about the introduction made by Trump to the then CEO of AT&T. Cohen confirms the introduction but admits he never informed Trump about these clients. The courtroom hangs on every word, sensing the gravity of the moment. Blanche continues, Mr. Cohen, did President Trump ever inquire about your consulting work? Cohen hesitates before replying, yes, he did ask at one point. Blanche seizes the opportunity and he was frustrated you signed a deal with AT&T? The prosecution objects, and the judge sustains the objection, cutting off a potentially revealing line of questioning. Unfazed, Blanche pivots to another crucial topic. Cohen's conversations following the Wall Street Journal article in 2018. Blanche recounts how Cohen spoke to various individuals, including New York Times reporter Maggie Haberman, his family, and his college friend Steve Croman, who was serving jail time. Blanche underscores that Cohen consistently told these people Trump knew nothing about the payment. In some cases, Cohen even recorded these conversations. Mr. Cohen, you repeatedly denied Trump's involvement at that time. Were you lying then, or are you lying now? Blanche's question hangs in the air, casting doubt on Cohen's current testimony. This moment is critical for the defense, as it aims to paint Cohen as unreliable and self-serving. The courtroom is charged with tension, each revelation adding complexity to the narrative. As this scene concludes, the focus shifts to the next phase of the trial where even more intense scrutiny awaits. 
As the trial continues, the defense shifts focus to Michael Cohen's personal ambitions, aiming to cast doubt on his motivations. Todd Blanche, with a calculated tone, begins his questioning. Blanche, Mr. Cohen, are you planning to write a third book and launch a congressional bid? Cohen, seated confidently, responds, Yes, I'm thinking about it. Blanche presses further. Do you believe your name recognition will help in a hypothetical run for Congress? Cohen nods. My name recognition is because of the journey I have been on and it is associated with Trump. Blanche, seizing the moment, retorts, Your journey has included daily attacks on Trump? Cohen, unflinching, replies, My journey is to tell my story. The courtroom is silent, the tension palpable. Blanche continues, Mr. Cohen, do you have a financial interest in the outcome of this case? Cohen admits, Yes, sir. Blanche, not missing a beat, asks again, Will you benefit financially from a conviction? Cohen, with a hint of defiance, states, No, it's better if Trump is not found guilty because it gives me more to talk about in the future. The defense's strategy is clear, to paint Cohen as a self-serving individual with ulterior motives. As Cohen's motivations are laid bare, the prosecution's Susan Hoffinger steps in for redirect examination, ready to counter the defense's narrative. The courtroom remains on edge, with each revelation adding layers to the unfolding drama. The stakes are high, and every word, every pause, is charged with significance. As this scene concludes, the focus shifts to the implications of these revelations on the trial's outcome. The prosecution's redirect begins by attempting to restore Cohen's credibility on the 2016 call he had with Trump and his ability to negotiate the hush money payment with Stormy Daniels. Were you too busy in October 2016 to get Trump's approval on the Stormy Daniels payment? Prosecutor Susan Hoffinger asks. No, ma'am, Cohen replies. In response to Prosecutor Susan Hoffinger asking Cohen what Red Finch did for Trump, Cohen said the technology company was asked to assist in a CNBC poll about the most famous businessmen in the last century. Cohen said Trump's name was on that list, but was at the bottom, which upset him. Cohen said he reached out to Red Finch, which assured him that they were able, through various IP addresses, to make Trump rise in the poll. Cohen testified that he told Trump and that they spoke about what number he should be, so as long as he was in the top 10, he would go to the next round of the poll. Cohen said he advised the CEO of Red Finch to start acquiring IP addresses and purchased more and more. Ultimately, when the poll came to its conclusion, Cohen said Trump was ninth on the list. In an interview with Fox News outside the courthouse, Trump's legal spokeswoman Alina Haba said, we know Trump wants to testify. He's willing. He is able. He has nothing to hide at all. He's absolutely ready to tell the truth. Still, she said, he's got to listen to his attorneys. Inside the courtroom, Trump's attorneys have not provided a firm indication that their client intends to take the witness stand. Nothing is prohibiting the former president from testifying in his own defense, and he could start doing so as early as this afternoon. Cohen said during afternoon questioning by the prosecution that he had no doubt about having a conversation with Trump in which the then-candidate gave him the okay to make the payment to Daniels. He said there was no way he could make the payment without Trump signing off on it because he wanted to ensure he would be repaid the $130,000. Trump's lawyer is cross-examining Michael Cohen again. Todd Blanche is grilling Cohen on whether he blames Trump for losing his law license. The prosecution rested their case. The defense calls its first witness. Daniel Sitko, a paralegal at Blanche's firm, takes the stand. The testimony is expected to be brief, after lawyer Todd Blanche said he would be used to enter a chart about phone calls. After the brief testimony of a paralegal for the defense, Trump's lawyers called Robert Costello. Immediately, the lawyers moved into a sidebar conversation with the judge. Costello said that Cohen told him that Trump was unaware of the payment made to Stormy Daniels. Robert Costello said on the stand that he met Cohen on April 17, 2016, at the Regency Hotel in Manhattan. Asked what he discussed with Cohen, Costello said that Cohen told him that his home and office were searched and he was absolutely manic. Costello said Cohen was marching back and forth in a conference room and was saying that his life was shattered. Costello said Cohen wanted him to explain his options. 
and Costello said he told Cohen that the type of search warrant executed was much harder to get. What's my escape route? That's the phrase he used, Costello said. Trump's lawyer, Emil Bove, said the defense wants to focus on whether Cohen said if he knew Trump was aware of the payment to Stormy Daniels. Costello said on the stand that Cohen said numerous times that Trump didn't know, that Cohen did it on his own, and that Cohen repeated that numerous times. The courtroom buzzed with murmurs and whispers as Costello's testimony challenged Cohen's earlier statements, casting doubt and raising questions about the true narrative behind the hush money payment. The judge called for a short recess, giving everyone a moment to absorb the implications of Costello's statements. As the courtroom emptied, the tension remained, a thick cloud of uncertainty and anticipation hanging in the air. Costello was visibly frustrated after multiple sustained objections cut off his testimony. He muttered, ridiculous to himself on the stand. To Costello's visible annoyance, Judge Merchant had to instruct him not to answer when an objection is sustained. Even after the warning, Costello emitted a loud geez after another sustained objection. Merchant did not take well to that, responding, I'm sorry. A chastened Costello was silent. Judge Merchant asked for the jury to step out of the courtroom and admonished Robert Costello, saying that he wants to discuss proper decorum. If you don't like my ruling, you don't say geez, Merchant said, adding that Costello can't strike anything because the judge is the only person who can strike something. You don't give me side eye and you don't roll your eyes, Merchant said. Costello said he understands. The courtroom atmosphere grew even more charged as the judge's stern words underscored the gravity of the situation. The tension was palpable, setting the stage for a trial that was becoming increasingly contentious. This moment, seemingly minor, highlighted the high stakes and the intense emotions simmering just beneath the surface. With the jury back in the room, all eyes were on Costello, who now had the weight of the judge's reprimand hanging over him. The trial was not just a legal battle, but a test of patience, decorum, and resolve. The defense has completed the direct examination of their second witness, Robert Costello. Following his testimony, it appears the defense may be nearing the end of its case, suggesting they might only have two witnesses to call. Costello continued to describe Michael Cohen in unflattering terms, referring to him as a drama queen while recounting their interactions post-FBI raid. He emphasized that Cohen was suicidal that day and very manic, painting a picture of a man under extreme duress. Prosecutor Susan Hoffinger seized on the opportunity to question Costello's characterization. Did you think Cohen was a drama queen for his response? She asked pointedly. Costello, maintaining his composure, replied, I didn't know Cohen at that time and thought he was putting on quite a show. Trump's lawyer Todd Blanche stepped in, arguing vehemently that the case cannot be decided based solely on Cohen's testimony. There is no way the court should let this case go to the jury relying on Mr. Cohen's testimony, Blanche asserted, emphasizing Cohen's history of lying under oath. Blanche's words echoed through the courtroom, highlighting the defense's strategy to discredit Cohen at every turn. Cohen has lied to the court repeatedly about his congressional testimony. His entire testimony in this case should not be considered, Blanche insisted. Judge Merchant, after listening to both sides, dismissed the court for the day. The trial will reconvene tomorrow at 9.30 a.m., leaving everyone to ponder the implications of the day's proceedings and what lies ahead. The courtroom emptied, but the tension remained, a palpable reminder of the high stakes and the intense battle unfolding within those walls. As the doors closed, the sense of anticipation for the next day's developments hung in the air, a silent testament to the gravity of the situation. If you want to stay updated with the trial, subscribe to the channel and let us know in the comments below. Do you think Cohen's testimony will influence the jury? We'd love to hear from you.